another Office Hours podcast with Michael and Paul Rabel, the brothers uh, behind the Premier Lacrosse League and leading the Premier Lacrosse League. Fresh off the first season, what was that like? It was great. It was exciting, uh, successful for us. It was challenging. Uh, anytime you're a part of building a business from the ground up uh, so quickly, there's there's a lot to reflect on. And I suspect uh, we're going to spend some time in this podcast going through it. But uh, emotionally, a, a lot of the, the ways I at least just described it uh, come to mind first for me. What about you, Mike? Yeah, you know, you work on something for such a long time and we were baking this for the last two two years yeah. um and then you know the countdown starts right when you hire a team and you know we really started really building it officially with our full team starting in march and we we launched june june 1st so <laughs> three months yeah nice. so when yeah. you have like a, a 90 day countdown each day is incredibly important to make decisions and you're lacking a lot of information often and so a good decision is just to make a decision sometimes, and then you learn from that. So I think we got to a place where that countdown for me was uh, a tough time. And then once, you know, June 1st hit at Gillette and we you know started playing games and operating, it was just, uh, it was an incredible experience. What was that feeling like at first, you know, you get to Gillette, you're seeing the last 120 days, 90 days take down to like what it actually became. I'm sure obviously it was a little different from you because you were on the field, but still like it's, I can't even imagine what that was like that building was my, as someone who's built something. Yeah, that was my first foray into actually understanding the intricacies of being a co-founder and operator of this league and also playing in it. Yeah. Because as a professional lacrosse player for so long, and this was a lot of the impetus of why we decided to build this, was to uh, recreate a system that was beneficial to our players. And we've given them stock options and healthcare, and we've elevated their wages versus the former league, which was major league lacrosse. So I was living that, uh, but as a byproduct of being underwaged and under supported as a professional athlete, you call them non core five uh, team sports, and individual sports, you have to go generate additional revenue streams elsewhere. So I had always been this entrepreneurial athlete, but the, the degree of which was required of me now, and then in our style of business where we're tour based and we're bringing three games every weekend to a new market at a premium venue, week one was at Gillette. I was the Sunday game on NBCSN and there were two games on Saturday that went off, which is a full day of programming and operating. And so I was there from our morning meeting at 7 a.m. with the team all the way through practice that I had with Atlas Lacrosse Club at seven o'clock that night. And I got back to my hotel room and I was exhausted. Probably stuff like a baby. <laughs> uh, not ideal for the day before yeah. your, your, your biggest game of your inaugural season, right? Which is the opener. So then I did it again the second weekend in New York and then had to recalibrate with Mike because I had to conserve energy, right? Yeah. Athletes, professionally, they spend their entire week around uh, exerting the right energy at the, at the forefront of the week balancing out your your uh, scouting reports and so on and then calming down through the weekend if you at least you compare contact sports like the nfl or the pll and your goal is to basically be fully charged for your game and what i realized i was doing is the exact opposite i was depleting myself in the office all week long i was training and then operating the first two games and playing in the third so there was there was like a lot of physical and spiritual challenges for me to figure it out uh, but that first game was was really emotional for both of us. I remember giving Mike a hug, and then even the two games on on Saturday, uh, I was down in inside the locker room, like celebrating with those guys because it was such a great experience for everyone. You don't get to both, you don't have the first game. There's only one first game. That's right. Right, and both those games went into overtime, which was crazy too. Right, um, and that was a big part of it as well as you know creating a lot of parity um, in a natural, organic way. But Paul's job was, uh, Paul's job still is a lot more intense than mine, right? Sort of bifurc trying to bifurcate the mind of an athlete, the uh, temperament, the the sort of physical condition you need to have versus being an entrepreneur, which uh, is pretty unhealthy, I think. Uh, uh, and, and that's why like business coaches exist and, uh, and specifically in the entrepreneurial space. And um, I think, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is, is glamorized a lot of times, but it's really difficult. And then building a professional sports league um, as a company, there's no real blueprint or roadmap for that. Um, and not that you know, great entrepreneurs need that, but I'm not certainly not one of those, but there was nothing for us to really follow. So we were building 
a lot of late nights uh, together in the office, a lot of even before that, we even had an office working out of a Brooklyn apartment. Um, he would know, take just, the couch because I have a bad back. He's <laughs> still to this day. He he offers me uh, when when you know when we're jumping around hotel to hotel. He offers me uh, uh, the bed. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, put on the, guy. I think I well yeah he needs it. We need him to perform. <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be a difficult transition when I do retire at some point, yeah, and then we have no to excuse. yeah, and then we have to really be egalitarian. It would be great. <laughs> it would get his full mind and and all the energy he puts into being an athlete into the into the business. It, it'll it'll give us a lot more horsepower than we even have currently with uh, with I'd say seventy five percent of your time. Right. But 75% of Paul's time is 150% of a lot of folks' time. It's, and it's not just me saying that. Even folks in our company often say they've never seen how relentless Paul is, how his brain is just constantly churning, constantly thinking about the business. And I think it relates back to when he was little. He has like this once he finds something he's passionate about, he becomes obsessive. Um, and I think a lot of great entrepreneurs are like that. And, uh, you know, he used to be obsessive about beanie babies. And he was like one of the largest collectors in Maryland. And we were like, dude, the, yeah, I mean, like the, one of the largest. And then he became one of the largest fans of The Rock. And he like read every rock book and was obsessed with WWE. University of Miami standoff. There you go. Yeah. You know? right? right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Little props there. And then, you know, he, then he started becoming uh, obsessive with basketball. And then it became lacrosse and started going along in lacrosse. And I think that's what made him such a great athlete. But now he's, he's so obsessive and, and, and um, focused on this business that we get that same sort of concentration and sort of at all costs, I'm going to make this work. And that's what you need out of a founder. Um, and it's great. Do you think at some point you're going to have to fire yourself from the playing standpoint to be able to maximize what it is like that? You got to ask his coach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 That's a unique way of putting it. Uh, but I would say uh, I, I'd prefer to retire, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and, and take the position as the athlete versus, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the founder. But I, but in sports, yeah, it's unique. That would, that would happen. Um, that would happen from the coach's perspective of, I, I just continue to persist in playing and, and wasn't talented enough one day to where I just don't make a roster. Yeah. I have a feeling that, uh, Mike, at least with his objective, I won't ever let me get to that place. Uh, but I've also, because, because I am so passionate about this business, I also have, you know, changed my long-term view around what's important to me. Right. And I think a lot of, especially top class talent in all sports, you, you try to create a world where you can play forever. Right. And we're seeing it with Tom Brady. Yeah. Um, and, and, and because it, it's, it is everything for Tom and I'm lucky because this sport is everything for me, but I derive a ton of fulfillment and intellectual growth from operating this thing. And from a playing capacity, I still get all of those rich experiences of locker room competition and forging new relationships and competing on the field and you know, just how transient uh, you can win or lose and rebound the nature of, of, of sport performance. I get those benefits right now, but I, I, see, uh, I see myself being you know, pretty decisive. Mike saying, make a decision earlier in this conversation we're having when the time's right. And when it comes to, obviously we talked about the success, you guys already mentioned the success, but I'm assuming there was a lot of like moments when you're like, shit, is this going to happen? Like, are we going to be able to do this? Like kind of talk about the way, what the journey was from like these, I wouldn't say dark moments, but the moments of any entrepreneur when you're like, man, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if this is a fit to now, you know, you're looking back a year later and looking forward now after a successful year and, and to what can be next. Yeah. I mean, I think we had a lot of support from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that came from the players. Um, you know, when, when we were sort of ideating on this, it was, um, you know, I watched 10 years of, you know, Paul and I have worked together in the past tangentially and together operating a fitness portfolio and investing together in, in uh, early stage companies. But um, the idea really came from sort of the pain that, that Paul and his, uh, his closest friends were undergoing as, as part of the incumbent league. Um, and so that pain was felt by me. And, and I don't know if it was like necessarily as like seeing the forest with the trees, but more of this is something that as a big brother, uh, I feel that pain. So let's go fix this. And then just the fact by the fact of me being a, a you know, a serial entrepreneur, I've, I took that mindset to it. And, uh, and, and so the biggest piece was trying to convince Paul that this was worth his time, right. To change from athlete, influencer, activist, uh, entrepreneur to, you know, full fledged co-founder, let's go build a sports league as a company. Yeah. Um, and that 
transition took, you know, a couple months of us going back and forth, uh, being thoughtful, researching the marketplace, understanding if single entity was feasible, what's the most capital efficient way to do it. Does the tour based model make a lot of sense? Let's dig into this, you know, this research model, figure out fan affinity. We went back and forth on a lot of iterations and finally settled on the idea. And then, you know, once you go through that and understanding the market, uh, not just the lacrosse market, but the overall sports and media landscape, um, you get to a place where it starts to become baked even, and then we got to a place where we were like, all right, let's go do this. Um, and that was sort of end of, you know, 2017. Is that of 2017? There, right. and there was a ton of risk that Mike and I both profiled for me personally, uh, you know, and, and through our, through my peer group that we had, you know, gotten under NDA and, and, uh, brought this opportunity to, because if we missed as operators, then you'd have myself and a core group of probably 120 guys out of a, out of a job. Yeah. Cuz the MLL probably wouldn't have let us back. Maybe they would have, who knows. Yeah. But your reputation's tarnished. Um you you certainly uh for if 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 we weren't able to get this over the goal line and let's keep in mind different than other startups that can push back their go to market because they're just not ready they need to tweak this, need to tweak that. You can't do that when you launch a pro sports league. You're selling tickets to a game or a series of games that take place on June 1. And so there's all of this stuff that that we just kept getting our backs closer and closer to the wall. And so that was, uh, I think, advantageous in hindsight because you just have to get shit done, uh, but also very feeling life-threatening. Um, and the other piece that was a risk for me that we knew and part of the challenge of why MLL wasn't working is that the owner of six of their then nine teams, now they have five teams, uh, was also the chairman of New Balance, who was my biggest endorser yeah. personally, right? And I had a multi-million dollar deal with them as just to be an athlete and to promote and influence and be an activist, as Mike had mentioned. Uh, and we knew because of that uh, conflict where they owned six of the nine MLL teams that they were probably gonna terminate that deal. Um, even though from a, from a legality standpoint, I didn't breach it. Yeah. Um, they claimed that I did and I ended up losing that deal. So we knew that there was going to be, you know, multi-million dollar economic risk. There's going to be a legacy risk. There's going to be a risk that we don't stand this thing up because a lot of things have to fall in place. But, um, we decided to take it on. And you're glad you did. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was a lot of no's. Don't, don't get me wrong. I think, like I said, the players were the first ones who really had our back. And once we knew we had the best players in the world and they wanted to be part of this with us and they were going to be lockstep every uh, every step of the way, we we then entered the space of raising capital and starting to speak to um, investors and potential sponsors. And um, as Paul mentioned, this wasn't like a technology company, um, although we're, we're, we're developing some of our own stuff down the line. But this isn't a this isn't a SaaS platform. Yeah. Right. This isn't something that's been like five salesmen and go sell. Yeah. This isn't, this is, this hasn't been really done before you just started. I mean, there's a couple that recently, but it doesn't happen very often. And so when you go to market with this idea and you start speaking to institutional investors and high net worth individuals who have a passion or uh, investment track record in this space, uh, they're kind of like, yeah, I don't, I don't really. And, and then we had never done this before. We never built a professional sports league. I think we both. Not been. many people have. I don't right. Think. So yeah. a lot, there was a lot of skepticism, you know, 90% knows, but all you need is that one. And you know, this yeah. you need is that one or two that are going to say yes. And then you find those and then, and then really bring them in and, and continue to iterate. And we were lucky that we have great, uh, investors such as uh, Rain and Joe Sai and Brett Jefferson, who are long-term capital. Um, and we had early believers like CAA and Churning Group who sort of saw our vision and wanted yeah. to be part of that as well. Um, and that really gave us that sort of initial rocket fuel to really go drive this through. And from your standpoint, what is it like? I'm sure, you, did you have an initial investors who said no after the first success come yeah. back? Yeah, yeah, we've we've had a couple recently come back. And you know, the, the cool part about where we are now is that um, uh, and, and we know you know you can never take offense to someone saying no, no. I, and, and it's okay to say for them to come back and say yeah now we're interested we want to see that you could do it we yeah. want to see that you could prove it out roll it out get through a full season let's see the product i think that's the best thing about what we've done is our product is incredible it's just it's just like a software business where your first iteration or your second iteration needs to be great it needs to be sticky consumers need to like it businesses need to like it they need to use it and i think that we've seen that through our growth metrics right um even on our broadcast, our, our product, we made the changes to the lacrosse product, but the second half of the season, our viewership went up 54%, right? So there's uh, adoption and uh, there's this, we're seeing this growth week over week in viewership and, and engagement 
to our product. So now we have that done and we'll always continue to watch it and refine it. But now that we have that, we've shown to be able to execute that. Now we can go really monetize the business. And what does monetizing the business look like for you guys? Well, if you look at pro sports leagues, it, they drop into four or five categories. Yeah. So your broadcasts, media rights. Uh, we also, uh, while bifurcating it, it, it underneath, we view media as not only social and digital as a lot of revenue is being driven towards those platforms on behalf of corporate sponsors, uh, but even features that our production team are able to create, docus, uh, you know, kind of like reality style programming that we're building out in 2020 and beyond. Um, those are assets that that can lead to revenue streams, significant revenue streams. So you have your media business, uh, you have your corporate sponsors, uh, which is a huge category across league properties and and franchises. Then you have your ticket business, so your traditional attendance and even in stadium from parking to concessions. Uh, the fourth area of revenue, and these aren't necessarily in order, and we can call out certain leagues where they capitalize more in other areas. But you have merchandise, yep. right? So, you know, European soccer leagues tend to do really well in merch because they're always updating their kits. Uh, it's a very wearable uniform. And, uh, and they're redesigning and, and it's just become a thing over decades where you buy your new club's uniform or you buy multiple players within your club. Um, merchandise isn't as big on the uniform front, at least in the NFL. Their licensing partnerships are huge with Fanatics and so on. And the NFL is a, a, just a giant 14 plus billion dollar a year business. Uh, but if you look at there, they're a media rights business, right? It's six and a half billion dollars a year across their different properties and networks. So it changes. Um, and then the last category for us is our youth is our youth business and it's called PLL Academy. And we were lockstep in launching the league with a youth strategy because not only getting sticks in hands, but instructing and, and leveraging the players who we have, many of them are entrepreneurial and they get into our markets that we're playing in and also new markets that we're exploring. And they're the ones instructing these kids. So getting more sticks in hands is important, but getting our players right in front of our fans and developing, uh, you know, as a byproduct of that, our league monikers and team identities and all that kind of stuff is really advantageous. And youth sports is a huge business and a really important business as we see obesity trends in America continue to rise and just wanting to get kids outside more. Yeah. And we just want them outside playing lacrosse. Um, so those are our five big revenue categories. And we haven't talked about sports gambling. We haven't talked about fantasy and other initiatives that we would kind of want to run down. And are those something in the pipeline that you guys are working on? Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even from the youth sports standpoint, right? I, I think we know internally, I think you guys told us like, that was a seven figure business for mm -hmm. you guys, right? Like, I think, and I think from your guys' standpoint too, like a differentiating, you guys took a differentiating tone on social and digital. Like you were doing things that most organizations weren't doing and outperforming them. You were doing different differently from an academy standpoint. Did you have some of these teams and leagues start to reach out to you and be like, what are you guys doing? Yeah, um, we actually have. And it's, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. We've, because of our uh, social and digital strategy and, and the engagement rate that we've had, which is six and a half percent across all of our channels, which is one of the highest in sports and um, sort of the innovative and creative ideas that our, that our media team's been able to develop. Sorry, it is the highest in sports. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but, but the other the other group who has that level of engagement is Bleacher Report. So that You'll find I'm like the humble one and, and Paul is the, the, the more confident <laughs> hey, one. The uh, advocate. I won't say con I'll say confident. Uh, and so when I'm humble, Paul will come over uh, the top and slam at home. They so say I best just, businesses have to have both of those. I'm right? just like, I give a little alley-oop and Paul will dunk it. Uh, <laughs> so perfect. So, so we've actually had, um, uh, several sort of, uh, tangentially related sports leagues and teams come to us and approach us, uh, sort of at the tail end of our season. And now in, in our on season, which, uh, we call is, uh, our off season, but, uh, about trying to figure out ways that they can either, gleam some light into our, our logic and, and our strategy, but, the, but then also um, uh, bring us on to be production partners. Oh, wow. um, and so we have to be like incredibly thoughtful about that. We actually had developed a, a, uh, a, a, a production team and a consulting service at the PLL called N52. Um, but we're, we have to be very selective about those projects because our number one goal is the PLL. But because of what we've been able to create, we actually are starting to onboard and think through different clients that maybe want white labeled content in the sports, um, in the sports space, or they, or because we know lacrosse marketing, we think the best, uh, they want to bring us on to help them do that. And, um, and so we've been excited about that opportunity as an additional revenue stream as well. Yeah. And, and the, the two additional benefits, one being 
revenue, as Mike said, the other being crossover promotion and influence. And if, if you're an influencer listening to this right now, you know this better than anyone. If you're a podcaster, given the medium that we're conversing on right now, you know this better than anyone, is that uh, crossover marketing is, is, is one of the fastest ways to build an audience. And so crossing over being, you know, we're going to come on your podcast and we'd love to have you on ours, yeah. right? And uh, in, in this case too, we go work with this established legacy league um, and oh, by the way, maybe we get some players, some of our players to come and do some stuff on your player's Instagram and your players show up on our player's Instagram. And then, and then both of our audiences are talking and identifying shared experiences from lacrosse to football, to basketball, to soccer, to hockey. And so there's a, there's that long tail impact too, that, that we're able to run down by building these relationships, especially in sports. And why do you think it took a startup league that really had no background to like jolt these people to see like i mean it's not it's not rocket science right it's, it's just like you guys are actually understanding right. what it is that's going on, on on social and digital but like why do you think it took you guys to do it to like move the needle for a lot of these people well i think that <clears throat> one of the best things about starting a new company is that there there's our learnings that exist yeah. right in, in the market and so we were able to take some of the learnings from the some of the the, the best run organizations and teams uh, across sports and say we like that and that makes a lot of sense that strategy or their tone of voice or the way they're approaching this um, and then some of the, the 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 failures of other teams and leagues as well and say let's not do that I think one of the things uh, for the PLL that, that allows us to iterate quickly is that we are purely a single entity. Yeah. We are a company running a league and we actually think of ourselves as a company first. When people say, you know, how big is your company? We have, you know, about 40 people working for the PLL, but then we have over 170 players. And so we really think about our, our company as being 200 plus people. Um, and we're constantly thinking about, you know, and driving home the message of our mission statement to our values, right? A training camp, um, you know, we got up on stage and talked to our players about we went through each of our values and talked about why the values are important to the PLL. I mean, what other sports leagues doing that and talking about their values? Do they have values that they're, they're driving, that are tied to their goals as a company, that are tied through evaluation as, of employees, but then are also tied to and, and meant for players? Um, and so those, those values will come up in conversation sometimes. I'll be talking to, you know, Will Manny and he'll say, I'm just trying to operate like an owner, which is one of our values. And I'm like, absolutely, that's great. Thank you. Um, and so I think that makes us unique. And it also, as being singly, allows us to make fast decisions. Yeah. So we don't have to go through several layers of, you know, a, a franchise owner versus his G, his or her GM versus like the team uh, or a PA. We can just make fast decisions at the executive level and execute them very quickly. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that, at least to your question, that I'd break it down into two areas. Uh, why did it take you guys to fix lacrosse? which uh, you know, we, could, we could spend time on. But the other one that I think that, that's more interesting, especially to, to your listeners, is some of the stuff that you at least identified from a social media standpoint, tactically, that we're doing in professional sports that now other leagues are doing. Whether that's our audio features in game with the NBC broadcast of actually miking up or using the technology that exists between a quarterback and an offensive coordinator in the NFL, taking that audio into a player helmet, and then instead of the old coordinator getting access to it, our talent in the booth, and they can talk to the players during the game. That was super innovative. Uh, like NASCAR has explored doing it, individual sports have explored doing it, uh, but to, to do it in a team sport during the run of play was really unique, submitted for Emmy. So that's something that I would qualify as tactically that we bring to the marketplace that we're seeing other leagues now adopt. Um, and the other is our social strategy. So everything from the way that we produce to our turnaround time, cadence of delivery, um, you know, differentiation across platforms. And uh, the first thought that came to my mind when you asked, and Mike answered most of it, is that sports are so powerful, so communal, and so massive that revenue, I mean, we talk, we talk about revenue in the billions for the legacy leagues. And they just have to limp into social to be effective. I mean, if you're, if you're a college, top college basketball player and you're drafted to the NBA, my estimation, if you're a lottery pick, is there's, a, there's like an immediate translation of six figures in following. And if you're a top player with some swagger, seven figures, just boom, here you go, because you're now in the NBA. And so you don't really have to be too strategic through these first five to seven years of social media proliferation. Yeah. And so I kind of think about it as it wasn't broken, so they weren't pushing themselves to fix it. 
Now, when you're in our, our position, we take the view of, you know, how can we leverage these platforms? How can we leverage these tools and be really innovative so we can take some share of voice? And so we were forced to, I think, be a thought leader and innovative there. And now that we've done it, the legacy leagues are like, oh shit, we got to do that too. And now they're coming to you to help. Yeah. You know, you mentioned sports betting and, and fantasy and, and some of these other emerging things. What role does that play with the emerging league of PLL and, and how do you see it going forward, especially given the backing and with the churnins of the like who have other, you know, interests in sports gambling, the action network, things like that. How do you see this almost like integrating where it's the PLL is the center of this, but also like you have the consulting arm. It's, it's just more than this league now. Yeah, I, I think gambling is critical and, and we're seeing it almost every day now, a new deal getting done. And uh, we're, you know, this is, this is state governed, not nationally governed. So it, there's, there's definitely nuance to it and we're tour based. Yeah. Uh, so th there's actually advantages for us um, but if you look at the benefit of, of gambling across sports leagues and particular in the NFL, it can account for upwards of 50% of viewership, right? I mean, take Thursday, Sunday, and Monday night football. Those are the most viewed football games on a weekly basis. And most of the time, those who are watching aren't fans of the teams, like geographic fans, right? They're just watching football because their fantasy results are tied to it or they're gambling on it. And, and that's been the not so best kept secret in the NFL. Everyone knows it, but gambling drives viewership. So gambling not only can drive revenue now with the partners that are partnerships that are being cut, but if we want to see increased viewership and stickiness amongst millennials and, and upwards, like you gamify it. And, and I view it as like a form of gamification. There's money on the line. You got to do it appropriately. And there's nuance too. So we've been working with our stat provider at SMT in 2019 and working on how we're building more robust statistic, statistical keeping uh, onward. Because if you're going to be in gambling and people are going to put money on the line, you're going to be in fantasy, people get money on the line, then you, you got to have a really robust statistical uh, team and then you also have to have a director of game integrity and, you know, uh, typically in, in a non-core sport, people are going to take a, 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 take a closer look at the game integrity and the product because our players aren't getting paid $25 million to play a season. Um, so there's a lot of nuance in executing and, and we're well ahead of it right now, which is good. Uh, but we're hoping to roll out a game in 2020. I'm really interested in sort of that like on-demand in-game betting aspect. Yep. Um, and I think about it, Paul hit the, the, the two nails in the head that we think a lot about uh, revenue and engagement. Um, but I like, the, I like, cause we're always talking about how do we get net new sports fans to yep. lacrosse. Um, you know, it, we, we're serving the endemic lacrosse community incredibly well, we believe, but how do I get that hardcore fan of football in Oklahoma to be a fan of the PLL, one of the teams? And so I think about sort of that in-game opportunity as a way to say, hey, you know, I don't know much about lacrosse, but I have the ability to bet in this game when the Redwoods are playing the Chrome and I'm going to bet on these things just to just because it's fun. And I, and I like that aspect of it. And, and then they're engaging with the sport more. Um, and then they ostensibly become a fan of, of lacrosse and, and our league and our teams. And so to me, that gets me really excited. Uh, you know, we we're working closely with a group called Boom Fantasy to try to figure that out. Um, and NBC has been doing some stuff with them as well across their other properties. Um, and so we're working, you know, with uh, in identifying what is their exact right strategy, because there's so many different strategies, but that's one that I get really excited about. And what do you think the strategy is for you guys? If there is no right strategy, how do you kind of approach it? I mean, th that's exactly what we're evaluating. So we're talking to, you know, we're talking to all the big players uh, right now and we're trying to figure out what are their needs? What can the PLL provide? Um, and then, you know, what are the things that we need based on our initiatives and our 2020 goals? Obviously revenue being one of them, uh, more engagement being another, but like, what are the things that the, as the PLL we can provide, you know, boom fantasy or a fan duel or draft Kings that they're not getting with other sports leagues. Yeah. Um, and so we have some interesting things that we're working on that they can't get with the NFL or the NBA. Um, and a lot of that goes to their decision-making ability and we own all of the rights and we can work and we have an incredibly innovative forward thinking, forward thinking partner like NBC, who is malleable to doing interesting partnerships. So there's a the type of things we're working on right now. Yeah. The, 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 table stakes of uh, spreads, points, OU. Uh, but then if you look at prop betting, which is really exciting for us, and then ways that we can actually interact with our viewer, because we're single entity, because we're more agile and we're faster than the legacy leagues, 
an example of that would be structuring with a wearable technology company, a deal where we can get uh, wearables on our players, integrate with NBC, deliver real-time feedback on player performance, whether it's hydration levels, heart rate, muscle expenditure throughout a, right, throughout a game, and then that assists or at least even not assist, just encourage people to take what they're, what they're seeing as a live viewer uh, conceptually to then prop bet what they think is going to happen. So there's increased engagement. Uh, there's the immediacy of in-game betting. Um, and then there's your, your tr traditional gambling. Yeah. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about, you know, the success and, and what's happened, but as you look back at the, the league and, and you plan as in your on season, what maybe didn't go as, as planned or did you find like there were some more impactful learnings from the things that did go right? Like what is something you look back on and like, man, that, that really is now driving our strategy for because it didn't go right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would, I would probably say, well, we, we spent a little bit of this conversation talking about starting a league. Yeah. Um, we, we knew that that was going to be really difficult, but everything from not only building out our respective business departments to uh, govern over the top of those five revenue streams I had mentioned. So we have a, a, a media company, we have a sponsorship uh, and, and consulting company, we have a, a ticket sales group, we have you know a merchandise business. So uh, building out those respective businesses and finding business le business leaders uh, was was you know really time consuming. Um, next to creating the structure and the bones of what I would say was our our biggest fear in in rolling out a tour based model in team sports, it made all the uh, economic and kind of business sense in go to market timing in capitalizing on available and state of the art venues and being in in year one at least 14 markets with six teams instead of six markets with six teams so it made all the sense in the world but anytime you change uh something that is legacy which is how people ingest team sports there has to be a, a really concerted marketing Effort comms PR that goes into here's why we're doing it, and they continue to repeat it. We still to this day have people that that are just picking up PLL, which is a good thing, yeah. and then asking what city Atlas is in, right? And so you have to have <laughs> these conversations, right? Yeah. And so I would say that that was a big challenge, and then um, and then the third one is is understanding and taking on stereotypes that have been attached to our sport for a long time. Yeah. Um, and something that I've been familiar with, Mike was probably less familiar with it, even though, uh, he, he and I both picked up a stick at the same time with a rec program when he was 14 and I was 12 outside of uh, Montgomery village, Maryland. Um, but you know, the game is a, is a native American sport. It's been around for over a thousand years. Uh, it's, it's roots are in, uh, the United States and Canada, but over the last 30 years, it's been really subjected to this Northeast preparatory school sport. Um, you had Jamel Hill, Hill in here earlier, and she wrote an article for The Undefeated in 2018 that uh, I interacted with her on where she was bringing uh, awareness to a Native American team who had been booted out of their rec league yeah. uh, for misconduct. And um, I think what we're trying to do, not only uh, for our players in building this league and being uh, led by them and focused on our fans, but but also changing the narrative or reshifting the narrative back to, I think, what our sport's all about and, and where it came from and uh, the, the, the continued growth and, and uh, in, incline in uh, inclusion and diversity and all these markets that are uh, inhabiting the game that don't get talked about. Uh, and, and so that is, uh, is that would say for me and, and definitely Mike, that's been more challenging than we uh, potentially had a line of sight on because the macro numbers were just so good and, and like participation and international growth and the IOC gave our sport recognition in, in 2018. But this is a, an, this is a bigger trend yeah. for, if we're able to, uh, if we're able to get the you know, kind of get back on track with what this game means and, and how it's, it's portrayed to the masses. Um, then I think really the, the sky's the limit for lacrosse. I, I think one thing too, um, just the, a learning for us was that uh, a lot of people call them corporate sponsorships, but we call them uh, partnerships. Yeah. But the sales cycle 
was a lot longer than we thought. I mean, you know this, yeah, yeah, yeah. this well, Adam, but, um, it, you know, we, we were in conversations with a group like Gatorade for almost two years, a year before we even launched, right? And um, they're one of the best groups to work with. But what we found is that our players are so willing to interact because we have a, a great relationship with them. Um, and we also, uh, they're also owners in the business. They have stock options. Yeah. They get five stock options every game they play that when we bring on a corporate sponsor, we talk about how important that is. So for example, you know, it took a long time for us to do a deal with Gatorade, but we're incredibly honored to be working with, you know, Shauna and Jeff over there. Um, but we bring them on, right? We've done, you know, in this past year, organically, players consumed over 25,000 Gatorade products for the season. And through that organic uh, consumption, we did six, almost 60 million impressions organically. Um, and that's just really out kicking our coverage with them. And so, you know, we learned uh, that, you know, the sales cycle's long, that our players are incredibly um, eager to work and interact with our brands. And therefore we create a lot of organic value for our partners. And so I think that those type of case studies are going to be great case studies moving forward when we have, and as we continue to have um, partnership conversations. A little bit easier the second time around, right? <laughs> Once you've done it, the conversations are a little bit easier. Yeah. 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 And once we've played games too, yeah. I mean, Mike and I were kind of cruising around New York city, Chicago and LA and San Francisco for a year and a half with a, a, a 10 page deck and a vision. And now we have games and broadcast highlights. And Sizzle reels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have a little it bit all. of an easier conversation. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm and sure. trust us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've done this before. You guys. Like, this is couldn't real. say that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you couldn't say anything. You're like, Hey, you know, we're just two guys selling yeah. a lacrosse league here. Yeah, you know right. I mean, not just obviously two guys, but you know, have the background. And I think you guys take an example and maybe it is because it's a single entity, but we, we spoke about this a little bit beforehand is, you guys have basically welcomed in your players and said, you know, it's not your, you know, not like you're lucky to be here. It's we're lucky to have you. How do you think mm -hmm. that's like shifted everything from not only I mean, you mentioned the sponsorship stuff, but perception of the league, even the feel of the league, you yeah. know, like them coming to you because they knew that you were as just invested as, as they were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it came organic to us through Mike's and my relationship and how he had let off this conversation uh, realizing how I was underpaid and under resourced and under marketed. So table stakes that we changed that, but different than most leagues on the planet, we also offered our players healthcare year round and then stock options in the business. And our view around just player equity, speaking holistically across the board is that athletes have always been huge influencers. Even going back to take an example like Joe Namath and Muhammad Ali. Yeah right? People, they just didn't have social media. Yeah, exactly. They just didn't have social. So social has exacerbated how valuable athletes are and it's increased their value. Uh, so much that we saw a trend where athletes were now looking to take, you know, equity in, in businesses in exchange for cash and a traditional sponsorship deal. And so we think the future is, is going to be so long that at least the legacy leagues would be able to restructure certain agreements which would be more difficult depending on the league. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's going to be what players associations and, and, uh, and agents are now going to be going after. And so we wanted to start that way. Uh, and then we found like, hey, there's also a, a lot of leagues that are in conflict with the PA or with their, their players. And why is that? We're better off if we're all rowing in the same direction. And as a result, I mean, there's no data that I can share with you behind this, but... You know, I remember having a conversation with our manager of content, Tyler Steinhardt and Mike and Andrew Sinberg, who's our VP of strategic ops in the room. After we had announced, we had sent PLL gear to some of our players and they were just wearing it and wearing it and wearing it. And we were like, have we ever seen the NFL players or the NBA players or major league baseball players wearing the league logo? Yeah. Like they had the opportunity they've had, and they still do have the opportunity to wear their team logos, but they're proud of the being a part of the PLL is because they're owners, they trust us and, uh, and we're trying to help them grow. And our long-term view is if our players get bigger, that, that benefits us. hundred percent. I mean, w you know, we've, we've, we continue to have conversations with owners and investors in the, in the sports space. And there's been owners and investors who haven't wanted to invest in the, in the PLL because we do give stock options yeah. to the players and like, ah, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that with my team. Mm. Um, and then we've had owners and investors like, absolutely. I'm in because that's the way of the future is that the biggest point of influence is with the athletes. We have to incentivize them in a way just beyond cash, uh, where they feel like, 
um, they're a more meaningful part of it. And then it's also easier to have a conversation about it, right, as well. It's like, hey, you're an owner, I'm an owner. Was that the right thing to say in your public vehicle of Twitter? Yeah. Let's think about that. How does that reflect on you as a reflect on the brand that you're an owner in? And then that changes the dynamic pretty quickly. Definitely. So on season, you guys are preparing for next year. What's what's coming? What changes? What what what's next for the PLL? Whether it's this year and, and beyond, or you know, this year, next three years, five years. Like, where do you actually see this like truly, truly end up going? Now that you've done it for a year and you can prove that, like, okay, we've done it. Now we have to build it, and now we have to grow it. Yep. So we've done it. Now we have to build it. Now we have to grow it. And a lot of uh, what we've uh, what we've talked about so far, and I mentioned gaming and gambling, yep. and you know, you look at other uh, creative solutions to drive awareness and new fans and, and revenue. Uh, but in the near term, uh, given that our tour base model is what it is, we're looking at new locations. Uh, we'll likely be back in 70, a little bit 70, 75% of the markets yeah. that we were in and the, in the same venues as well. Uh, so you look at new locations, which is really exciting. And, and frankly, I think beneficial to being a, a tour base league. Because yeah. people love the PLL and a lot of those people didn't get access to the game and now we can bring it to them. Uh, so that's really great. Um, secondarily is, is looking at our media. So we're going to unveil new shows, um, you know, scripted, unscripted content on top of just covering games and our players. Uh, we, we see a lot of opportunity there. Um, and that's exciting. When we look at our, uh, our fan experience, how are we going to continue to jazz up the weekend, either at our current run of venues, uh, using new technologies available, we're likely going to have an in-place ticket partner in 2020, which would be helpful for us. And, and when you talk about the process, one of the yeah. challenges in being tour based is we were using different ticketing groups every week. Tough. So we're basically starting the sales process and the back end to, to front end customer experience based on the platform that we were using. Um, and so synthesizing that's going to be really important. Um, we're looking at new sponsors. So bringing on bigger founding partners in major categories. I mean, from our lead founding partners, which were Adidas, Capital One, Gatorade, Vineyard Vines, Corning Gorilla Glass. I mean, it was it was really exciting to bring on partners of that magnitude. Yeah. But if you think about sports and the multitude of categories and the people that you touch, there are a lot. So uh, we have a pretty good a, a initiative there. So that's near term. And then if you look at long-term growth for sports leagues, they typically uh, start and end with expansion. So adding teams, uh, in a traditional city-based model, that's a different process than one that we would look at in a tour-based model, yeah. where we have six teams now. Uh, what does a seven-team look like? Uh, what does an eight-team league look like? Um, at what point now, if you're looking at five and 10 years into the future, uh, if you have 10 to 12 teams in a tour-based model, are you hosting essentially uh, two, game, two, two sets of games in different locations over the same weekend? Um, and that's the way you would essentially be able to service a 10 to 14 game regular season schedule with an all-star break playoffs and championship. Or as we grow, and again, the tour base model helps us grow faster, then do we flip back out of a single entity to uh, potentially stay in it like the MLS and, yeah. and franchise out to uh, different city owners and we go franchise based or do we make the full switch to a trade association? Um, we view that city alignment as not only still relevant and important, um, the NFL, I think, uh, leverages more of its hereditary fan base than maybe the NBA, the NHL, which are, are I think, accent really well in the playoffs and uh, have a better crop of millennial fans that may support the Capitals when they move to D.C. for their first job and then go back to L.A. and uh, and support the Kings here. So there's, uh, there's that, but we also think the benefits of being a city-based league and, and, you know, finding long-term local partners from a sponsorship standpoint as one example is, is still there. And so, uh, there's, there's additional revenue that can be earned there, but that, that would be, uh, I think our short-term strategy, what you're going to see next year, and then, uh, where we're looking to potentially take this thing long-term. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm sending a text to our, our head of BD saying oh, we're not going to be we're running a couple minutes late with Nestle, with Nestle pitch. So, Tough sorry, so, so, sorry. Slight flex. Huh? Yeah, yeah, no, no, just, just, uh, 
so yeah, that's no, good. Paul, no, it, it is a, a slight flex. Yeah, but, it's a slight you know, flex, but it's he's also like flex more. Yeah, we uh, Paul hit all. How the many pitches think, do we make a week though? Uh, well, I think one of the things that, that I think a lot about too, as Paul says, is, is obviously long term, um, and you know we think about sort of who else can we bring um, into the fox, the PLL foxhole with us, and you know we've seen a lot of value from bringing in, like I mentioned before, very strategic um, uh, sports and media investors. And there's even um, institutional non-sports and media investors who are great at operating companies that are part of our cap table that have been incredibly helpful in certain markets. Like we have a, a, a consortium of investors in Boston who work in the private equity space who are like, uh, just razor sharp on operating businesses yeah. and getting leverage out of them. And, and I speak to them almost weekly and, you know, that value of having those folks in our, in our cap table, as we expand and get to a place where there's sort of like push and pull versus have we extracted all the value of the tour based model, or is this going to go forever versus should now we dip into the city based model? One of the values dipping into the city based model is if we break away from pure single entity and bring on franchisees, how do we bring on the greatest franchise sports owners? Yeah. Um, because when you bring on a great one, he or she brings so much value to the league. You know, their network locally, the relationships, the way they operate, um, those things just really put even more rocket fuel in what we're doing. So that's something we're constantly thinking about and having those conversations you know, three to five years early um, and sort of pre-baking them uh, with us and allows them to sort of track us, something we think about too. So how long till profitability? Ah, um, we, <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we it's track something we, it. Yeah. It's yeah. Something we're always, we're always, I mean, you, you one of, of our values is think critically, right? So we're constantly thinking critically about our budget, but, um, you know, it's always the balance of like top line growth versus profitability. And one of the great things about so our model and, and, and being tour based is it's capital efficient. And so we feel in the next you know few years, we could turn on the, the profitability uh, spigot pretty quickly, but then that also sometimes at odds is at odds with growth. Yeah. And so that's just one of those conversations that we have to figure out with our board um, and, and the cost benefit analysis of, of pouring resources into growth or sort of scaling back, hitting, uh, you know, your profitability um, uh, metric and then, you know, sort of being purely financial independent. But, you know, the good thing again about us is that we have long-term capital and they see the sort of the long-term vision. And the other thing too is like, you know, this is sports teams. A lot of them are profitable. A lot of them aren't. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them trade on the enterprise value, the, the equity accretion, right. Of the, Most the, and the brand owned by value. people who don't need it to be profitable. We don't need it to be profitable. Yeah. Um, they break even or sometimes they're not. And that's okay because top line growth and, um, they know they're going to be trading on the enterprise value down the line. So those are just like things we take into consideration, but, um, it's certainly possible. And that's why we wanted to start this way where we have ultimate flexibility that we could turn to a cash flow vehicle and we're financially independent. We don't have to ever, um, think about raising capital or going back to our investors to raise more capital again. And, and the good thing is we're years down the line of having to think about that. And, and our investors and board members allow us to really focus on building and operating because most, if not all of them are former entrepreneurs and how important that is. Yeah. If you get in the game where you're just constantly capital raising, you're not operating the business. Or even just like worried about where the capital is coming from or right. anything like that. Right. Finish it up. Biggest lesson you learned. I keep a theme of going first or do you want me to go? Uh, I'll go first. Yeah. I, I think uh, communication. We, we didn't get to, to talk too much about um, Mike and I working yeah. together. Uh, but yeah, there's it, it, it's a challenging thing to uh, run a business with someone that you're uh, so deeply connected to. Um, and there's been, you know, old connotations associated with not mixing friends and business and family and business. Um, but I actually view it, especially uh, as challenging of a process it was to get this thing off the ground is advantageous because I had someone who was one, um, much sharper in areas where I was weak. And there are a lot of them, especially on the business side, uh, but to someone that I could blindly trust. Um, and then someone that was in the bunker with me, um, when things got really dark and low, um, which they always do. Yeah. Uh, for entrepreneurs. And, uh, but on the flip side too, in psychology, at least speaking um, in that forum is that uh, your safest relation, you, you, you tend to, and we all do show our worst selves to our safest relationships, yeah. right? So we get in arguments with family members or spouses or, or closest friends. Um, and so in business, having to bifurcate 
uh, when Mike and I are brothers and when we're co-founders, I think it was, was one lesson we've learned and <laughs> we've spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, and then the other is like also creating uh, maybe a, a, a new relationship together and, and whether it's a mixture of both. And, uh, and I think that's, that's core to uh, having him as not only co-founder and CEO of this business, but us to continue to, uh, to push this thing forward. Yeah. And I, and I'd say, I mean, all of those things that's that Paul said, he hit the nail on the head perfectly. I'd, I'd say two things on, on my end is, is one, um, just like being really intentional, intentional about our goals and making sure are those goals, especially as 2020 and we're, it comes and we're in the on season. I mean, 2019 was just, let's get this thing built. <laughs> yeah. Right. And let's get it Same. up and running. Feel it. Right. You yeah, know how yeah, it is. Yeah. You just get it running. And yeah. it's like this American way of like, let's just get it out to the market and like, let's see how it goes. And Pure now, brute force. Yeah. You just put your head down. So now it's like, okay, we got it out to market. It's been received well. Look what we've done. What are the things we need to really focus on and over the next two years? I think everyone likes to talk about five years. Over the next two years, we need to absolutely nail in order for this business to take off even farther. Um, and then trickling that down through the organization um, and then being very, very intentional and clear about these are the goals and then how do all the sub goals within each division of the group build to those larger uh, company goals. And I, I, I'm constantly going back to that. We're iterating on the now, we're working on that now and just making sure everyone, so every time anyone makes a decision, there's just this like slight prison they're looking through is okay. Are we doing this and this with this effort, right? Because there's so, as a sports league, you can do so many different things all the time. How do we stay focused on those goals? Um, and then the second thing is like realizing that um, and this is sort of me, um, eating my own dog food, but it's like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Right. When something doesn't go well, like take a breath, breathe, it's going to be all right. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to die from this. No. Right. And I have to tell myself that all the time. And that's why I check in with Paul a lot. He's just like incredibly optimistic all the time. And it's like, this is good. <laughs> and so they find me like, a, if I'm being too much of a realist, yeah. edging on the side of being a pessim pessimist, I can call Paul and this is like extreme optimism and positivity and just like brute force get through it. And I need that. Um, we all do. yeah, we all do. So it's a mixture of, you know, that, that optimism plus like breathing, like it's going to be okay. I'm not going to die from this. It's going to be all right. Perfect. N52 also offers those, uh, private one-on-one -on -one <laughs> optimistic sessions. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's another, it's another, uh, yeah. another, another service angle eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Software or uh, therapy a as call. a service. Therapy call. as a service. Yeah, yeah. yeah call Paul. Yeah. Call, call Paul. <laughs> That's gonna be part of the app, right? Yeah. There's gonna be anything. It's call Paul. It's actually a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, we just there you go. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I internalize all of my yeah. uh, struggles. N Ninety-nine cents. Call Paul. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate cool. it. Thanks, man. Yeah.